Hello folks, it's Beth Wright and I am providing you a podcast about dialysis, different types of dialysis and kidney surgery. This is for your NUR 205 class and it is coming from chapter 54 in your med surge book. Okay, so treatment options for renal failure uh, are going to be involving dialysis uh, is one of the big things. Also, kidney transplants is something that we used to include discussion about, but that's transplants in general have been moved to another unit, but that's also done for renal failure as well. So here we're going to talk about dialysis and we're also going to talk about kidney surgery um, a little bit at the end. So dialysis is basically the movement of fluid and molecules across a semi-permeable membrane from one com uh, compartment to another. And it really doesn't matter which type, uh, whether it's hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, uh, that's what they use. Uh, both of them use that same concept, um, the semi-permeable membrane. Uh, which helps filter the good stuff from the bad stuff. And so we're going to talk, um, you know, about this in more detail. But basically dialysis begins when the patient's uremia, uremic, and they can no longer adequately manage, uh, you know, usually you will see the GFR here on the patient below 15. And so here you see just a picture of showing, you know, in the middle there, that semi-permeable membrane uh, and what happens there with those molecules. Uh, it pulls those, um, you know, things that need to be uh, out of the blood into that dialysate, which is a solution that helps pull that uh, those materials there, but that membrane is what helps, you know, distinguish what's bad and what's good and what needs to come out of there. Um, so just as a diagram to show you that. So who needs dialysis? Uh, people who have acid base problems, um, used for those who are in, you know, dealing or can't cope with or body can't cope with. Uh, acidosis, uh, someone with electrolyte problems, you know, if it's so bad that it's causing those cardiac issues uh, with that potassium or maybe, you know, too much uh, calcium. Uh, certainly intoxications like drug overdoses you may see or poisonings, uh, you know, somebody that's uh, in a hepatic coma because of, you know, alcohol use. You might see those people needing dialysis. Uh, overload of fluids, um, an urgent indication for dialysis uh, in patients with chronic renal failure would be like a pericardial friction rub. Um, and then, of course, those uremic symptoms when they get those. And, and you can see the little man here in the picturegram, uh, you know, with the, the kidneys uh, and the bladder, of course, the urinary system just looking in pretty bad shape there. But A-E-I-O-U. So let's first talk about that hemodialysis system. That's our vascular hemo. When you see that word, hemo, think blood there. And, you know, that's our vascular access. And you can see there where uh, the... Uh, the tubing is going uh, through the, uh, you know, into the venous and coming out of the arterial. So you got basically two, two lines here happening on an individual. And we'll talk about how that all occurs. But this is, uh, this mechanism is a rapid fluid and electrolyte shift that causes that. So the, the body has to be ready for that. Um, 
In this type of dialysis, there's an artificial unit called a dialyzer, and you can see that uh, dialyzer there. It's a little tube looking thing. I don't think the mouse on here works. I've tried it before, but you can see the dialyzer. And, you know, that's where that semi-permeable membrane is occurring. Uh, and so um, the dialyzer mimics the action of a nephron where it filters things out. Now, to undergo the hemodialysis, a person must first have a minor surgical procedure to create an access for the needles and the tubing uh, needed to connect the blood circulation to the dialysis machine. And we call that an AV or arteriovenous fistula, or it can also be called a shunt or a fistula, uh, AV fistula. Uh, also, you might hear it called a graft because that's a, a different type that can be done as well. And a person, uh, once they have that graft done or the fistula, the AV fistula done, uh, they don't have to worry about getting stuck, uh, you know, every time in a huge vessel because we, you know, it has to be a pretty big vessel to handle uh, this major uh process that's going to go on because here's what's happening folks the entire blood supply goes through this dialysis process okay so you'd have to have a pretty big vessel to handle all of the blood coming out and all the blood going back in um, and so that's why these av fistulas are done um, so the person it, you know it, it takes about uh, four hours at each session for the dialysis and the, the hemodialysis and it has to be done three times a week so they go to a dialysis center usually for this on an outpatient basis uh, it also can be done in the home but uh, it's, it's done three days a week and it's you know takes about three to four hours to go through this um, so the you know person is connected to the dialysis machine uh, via the shunt or the fistula whatever it is that they have and the dialysis machine pumps the blood through that dialyzer which filters off that waste products and excess fluid and uh, you know any kind of excess body chemicals um, and then the newly cleaned blood flow uh, flows out of the dialyzer and then is returned uh, back to the body uh, in a different set of tubes. Um, and you can see the arrow going out, the arterial blood coming out, going through the dialyzer, and then going back in in the, the venous area um, there. So... Again, uh, hemodialysis is performed usually at a dialysis center, um, and of course people have to be specially trained. Uh, they do have these in most of the hospitals, in the larger hospitals at least, and uh, they can also be done there. And of course, again, intensive training has to be done, uh, but you may be caring for a patient that has uh, that's on dialysis and has an AV fistula. So anytime you have, or you know, a shunt, how, whatever you want to call it, or a graft. Um, so anytime you have a patient there, we should always assess the circulation. And I, rem I know you remember the word breathe uh, in assessment, and that was something that you never wanted to hear, right? When uh, you were taught about it, it was like we shouldn't be hearing breathe. Uh, because that's a turbulence of blood flow. Uh, well, this is one time you do want to hear it. We should have a turbulent blood flow because basically an AV fistula uh, is where there's an arterial, an, I'm sorry, an artery and a vein that's connected together. So you got the force of that arterial blood, you know, coming through and then it's you know going against the venous uh, area and so 
you're going to hear a brewery there, and we want to hear a brewery there. A lack of a brewery may indicate a blood clot occurring uh, there, so we want to hear that, and you can palpate that, and I like to say, feel the thrill, uh, because you it'll it'll you'll feel the turbulence as well. So uh, I kind of it reminds me of feeling a cat, you know, patting on a cat at, that's purring. That's what it reminds me of when you pet a kitty cat and they're purring. That's what it reminds me of. So you should feel that and listen to it. You want to listen and hear the brewery for sure. Um, if you don't hear the the brewery and you don't feel the thrill, then you got to get notification to the healthcare provider because it could be clotting off. You want to try to protect that and save that because, you know, it is a surgical procedure. It is a dialysis patient, a renal failure patient's lifeline. Um, and so we definitely need uh, to take really good care of that and teach the patient how to take care of it. Um, we want to avoid using that arm for any kind of blood pressures or IV sticks, venipunctures, anything like that. We would monitor that site, you know, for bruising, swelling, bleeding, especially after they have dialysis. Uh, for home care, we would teach about keeping the fistula clean and dry. Notify the provider if there's any pain, swelling, redness, or drainage from the arm. Uh, they can exercise the arm, and it's recommended to, you know, to use the arm, but we don't want to have excess pressure on the arm. Uh, for instance, you know, some people sleep on their with one arm up. This is not the arm they need to sleep on. Um, they need to avoid wearing constrictive clothing or jewelry or any heavy lifting uh, with that arm with the AV fistula. Um, they need to avoid showering, bathing, or swimming uh, for several after hours after dialysis uh, because the needles on those are like a 14 gauge. You know what an 18 gauge looks like. Think about, you know, how big the 18 gauge looks like, you know. Well, a 16, 14, 12 gauge needle, that's what's used for these, and they're huge. They're like a water hose. Uh, well, not quite, but, the, you know, they, they're huge. So, you know, we want to give that skin time to heal up there and not expose it to anything that might be dirty. Um, before dialysis, of course, weighing the patient's going to be important. Uh, getting a baseline, vital signs, uh, blood pressures uh, going to be very important. Also, uh, you know, obviously these patients are sick. And they may have other, you know, other, uh, I can guarantee you they will have other meds that they are on. So we need to um, be sure to check if you're caring for this uh, patient that's going to dialysis in the hospital setting, need to check about meds um, before they go to dialysis and, and see, for instance, blood pressure medicine. Uh, you do not want to give uh, blood pressure medicine to patients going to dialysis because one of the side effects of dialysis is hypotension because of all the crazy fluid shift going on. And so we will bottom out the patient even more. Um, and any other meds you need to check with uh, the provider or the dialysis nurse. They usually have protocols on that. Uh, if it's, you know, once a day med, usually those meds can be given after they return from dialysis. But we need to be sure to check on that. Um, let's see what else. So we talked about how long it lasts and how often, two, three to four hours at a time. And they have to do that at least, you know, every other day is what you see. So a person may be Monday, Wednesday, Friday or they may be Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Um, Post-procedure, um, they will be, well, during the procedure, they will uh, potentially monitor certain labs. Also, before procedures, they may draw some labs. Uh, and then post-procedures, they'll draw some labs uh, to, you know, make sure things are going as they should and also maintaining pressure 
at that site where the uh, dialysis is uh, taking place at. Now, complications can be something called a disequilibrium syndrome, and that's where, you know, the patient will have cerebral edema, uh, forms from less rapid excretion of waste um, behind the blood-brain barrier, and um, uptake of fluid by brain cells. So we got to assess for headache, mental confusion, Decreased level of consciousness, nausea, vomiting, twitching, and even seizures can occur with that. Uh, so there may be a need to have an anticonvulsant med given. Um, may need to shorten the time or redu reduce the blood flow rates to prevent. Um, also, um, staff need to be sure to wear protective equipment such as eyewear, glout, gowns and gloves during the procedure. This is another access. Uh, a lot of times you'll see the patients when they're first started on um, dialysis, they will have this uh, type, you know, like a, a central line placed in that is used for and only for dialysis. Uh, and, you know, that can be used until the fistula, the AV fistula is, um, you know, the, that procedure is done and, uh, you know, until that can be used, the AV fistula. Because, uh, you know, anytime, obviously, a patient has something like this, they're at high risk for infection. These patients, as you already know, are already at risk for infection, and so we could do a double whammy on them there. Uh, so, you know, it's great to have this access. It can also, this you might see this access used uh, in the event that the AV fistula clots off or something. This is another route that they can take until another fistula is uh, available. Okay, so this is your different vascular accesses. Um, you can see there the fistula. Uh, on B there, and well, A is a different type of uh, Teflon vessel tubing that can be used to create the fistula or the, uh, you know, the graph. Uh, B is a fistula, so what basically what's happened, an anastomosis of an artery and a vein, uh, and then they connect those two together. Uh, and if you've ever seen uh, a fistula on a patient. It's very, it reminds you of when you see it, uh, like a humongous varicose vein on a person. And the most common place, I guess, to see these is the arm area, the forearm area. Um, but it looks like a huge um, varicose vein in there. Uh, and again, this is what you're going to need to assess. You're going to, you know, feel the thrill and you're going to listen for those breweries there because we've got to do that. Um, and then the last one, uh, the C one there is a, a graph that's done. So again, you can feel this uh, in uh, on the patient's arm or wherever it might be. So again, complications, of, you know, during um, dialysis, the patient can experience hypotension, muscle cramps, loss of blood, uh, exsanguination is a loss of blood. Um, so if there's problems with the sight or the needle becomes dislodged, you know, we might experience that. Um, they can experience chest pain, um, dysrhythmias, air embolism, sepsis. There's the disequilibrium syndrome. Um, hypertriglycerides uh, have been associated with hemodialysis as well. Um, anemia, fatigue, lack of energy, GI problems, um, sleep problems you might hear from individuals. So all of those can be an issue. 
And, you know, with that disequilibrium, I forgot to mention that, you know, the BUN here, obviously your BUN is going to be elevated because we're, we've got a person with chronic renal failure. But it can get really, really, really get high. Uh, so, you know, if a patient's BUN, say, is 150, watch out. Um, this is where you can see seizures happening and that kind of thing. So take a look at that, those labs. So, you know, again, this is something that's done rapidly within three to four hours. Your entire blood supply is taken through the dialysis extremely hard on the body. Um, and, you know, it, it's a lot of nursing care that goes on. Now, the other type of dialysis is peritoneal dialysis. And this is where, basically, um, we it says it in the name, in the peritoneum, it's uh, done to remove toxins from the blood of clients with acute or chronic renal failure. And it uses that peritoneal membrane uh, as the semipermeable dialysing membrane. Uh, and so we use a hypertonic dialysing solution, dialsate, um, is what that's referred to. And it's instilled. Uh, put into the peritoneum through a catheter um, and excess concentration of electrolytes and uremic toxins are moved by diffusion across that peritoneal uh, membrane into uh, the dialysis solution. So we put that solution into that peritoneum uh, and it draws that the toxins, the waste that, you know, the poisons that are in the body. Um, and draws it into that solution, and then we drain that solution out after a specific dwelling time. Um, so it's pretty fascinating to think about. It's a totally different way of filtering waste from the body. Uh, we're using that, but you know, in the peritoneum, we have that uh, the the peritoneal. Uh, membrane is where the lining of, uh, you know, it's the lining of the abdominal cavity. And, you know, where the peritoneal membrane is so large, it has a really rich blood supply. Um, and in people with kidney failure, the peritoneal blood supply, like all the other blood in the body, contains a lot of waste products and fluid. Uh, and so the thought of using this area as a dialysis area makes good sense. So when that clean fluid or the dialysate fluid comes in contact with the blood supply, the waste travels into that cleaner fluid. Um, now, <clears throat> who are candidates for peritoneal dialysis? Once who cannot handle that rapid fluid electrolyte and metabolic changes with hemodialysis, basically. Um, the, the good thing about peritoneal dialysis is that, you know, you, or, you, know, you do it. Once that fluid, uh, you know, is, it stays in there for a little while uh, based on whatever is ordered, and then it's drained. Um, and, you know, it allows the patient, then you're done, you know. It has to be done every day, but you're done then. Uh, and it allows the patient a greater independence because, you know, they can, number one, perform this at home on their own. Uh, so, you know, you, of course, have to have somebody who's motivated, but, you know, still, uh, it's, it's one that would seem to be, uh, for those individuals who are uh, more independent, I guess you could say. And you can see another picture there where the tube is going into that peritoneal cavity. There you have, you can see up at the top where the fluid, uh, you know, is held up and it infuses by gravity uh, and then uh, after it's, it stays in in a specific amount of time uh, period, you know, and, and then or we call that indwelling time, and then the outflow 
uh, you can see the dotted lines on the right hand side there at the lower part uh, when our dwelling time is up then the collecting tubing is uh, lowered again with gravity and the tubing uh, you know is connected and and then we have uh, the fluid draining out so that can be uh, you know in and out type of thing I guess you could say Now, complications of peritoneal dialysis. Obviously, anytime we have an invasive procedure like that, uh, we can have uh, exit site infection. So you know that 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 goes for anything. Um, peritonitis can occur, and so you know that's where the peritoneal lining becomes uh, inflamed, and bacteria uh, can occur. And, you know, if we have signs of that, that's crucial that we get on top of that pretty quick here. Uh, because, you know, if it gets infected, uh, the peritone if they have peritonitis and it gets infected, then they're going to have to switch to uh, hemodialysis. Um, we can also have, um, well, let's talk a little bit more about peritonitis, uh, peritonitis. So what is it you need to check? Vital signs for one, you'll see hypotensive, you'll see a fever. Uh, they'll have persistent abdominal pain. Um, the output from the dialysis may be slow or it may be really, really cloudy, a different color than what uh, you suspect you expect to see. There may be edema and redness uh, and rebound tenderness around the catheter site there. Um, white blood cells may be elevated, uh, may be elevated also in the fluid output. Uh, they may have diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal uh, distension. There could be hyperactive bowel sounds. Um, also, uh, the drainage fluid it may even have to have a culture and sensitivity. Um, and, you know, if they have repeated infections, it can cause adhesions and scarring, so that definitely would not be good. So, you know, we want to be on top of that, and certainly a patient at home, we've got to teach him the signs and symptoms of this. Abdominal pain can be a complication, and of course that could be several things. It could be peritonitis. It could be uh, intraperitoneal irritation. It could be the placement of the catheter. You know, it could be if the pa if that catheter touches the bladder or the bowel or the peritoneum. Uh, so sometimes just changing positions um, may help with that. Um, there can also be accidental um, um, infusion of air. Or infusing solution too fast can cause referred pain in the shoulder. Uh, so, you know, slow rate and usually that will subside. Uh, hernias can occur because we have messed with that peritoneum and the muscles and all the stuff in that abdomen. So because of the weakening of that, we sometimes can have uh, hernias to occur. Um, we can have increased bleeding, so we need to monitor the BP and the uh, hematocrit. We can have, uh, well, we got carbohydrates and uh, lipid abnormalities. That can happen as well. We can have low back pain issues. We can also have pulmonary uh, complications due to atelectasis or pneumonia, bronchitis, due to the displacement of the diaphragm uh, from all that fluid in there. Uh, and that results in a decreased lung expansion. So we got, you know, need to listen to our lung sounds um, and see, see about that. And of course, we need to encourage an incentive spirometer if we have a, uh, a risk for atelectasis or pneumonia. Um, the longer the dwell time, the greater the likelihood of problems. So we need to think about that and anticipate that. Um, teach the patient about deep breathing, repositioning, and elevation of the head of the bed. 
Um, also, definitely, um, we'll see a loss of protein um, from the uh, dilate, and uh, so it may need uh, protein in the diet if it's normally restricted. Also, um, I think we've covered everything. I guess a loss of ultrafiltration is, you know, basically it stops working uh, after a certain amount of time. We have to kind of be watching for that as well. Okay, this is another type of um, peritoneal dialysis, uh, continual renal replacement therapy. Um, and uh, this is maybe, actually this is a dialysis machine. Uh, it's an alternative or adjuvant method to treating acute renal failure. And uh, it's basically the patient is hooked up to a continuous dialysis machine. Um, and it's used uh, if, patient, if the patient's hypotensive during hemodialysis or if the peritoneal dialysis is contraindicated, um, then um, the continuous renal replacement therapy can be used. Candidates for this are those who are uh, fluid overload or uh, obviously acute or chronic renal failure, life-threatening electrolytes, overdoses, things like that. Okay, nursing care of patients hospitalized during dialysis. So, you know, we definitely need to protect that ac uh, the vascular access and care of that site. We've got to definitely take great care of that. Uh, so we're going to assess the site for patency, signs and of uh, potential infection. Again, no blood pressure or blood draws. Um, we want to, you know, monitor that those uh, those sites at least every hour, eight hours, um, and you know if we're lacking the thrill, uh, could indicate a blockage or a clot. Uh, it could also indicate infection or a low blood pressure, and we need to be checking that because a low blood pressure. Think about it. If if somebody has a low blood pressure then that could cause the fistula to clot off and and you know not be useful it would not be useful then um, so if the blood flow is reduced uh, accesses the access can clot off and and or if there's an infection there uh, so we got to definitely be monitoring for signs and symptoms and you need to know those signs and symptoms um, need to monitor fluid balance and IV therapy. We need accurate I know. And IV administration obviously would need to be done with a pump. Uh, watch for signs and symptoms of uremia and electrolyte balance. Regularly check those labs. We, we definitely got to. Um, most of the time the IV fluids are administered at a low rate to avoid overload. Um, and we, you know, we want to check the I know. Uh, breath sounds, vital signs, that kind of thing. Uh, because remember, their kidneys aren't working. Uh, and so, you know, we're going to, we don't want to overload them with fluid there. Um, the uremia status, you know, the higher the metabolic rate of a patient, the more waste will accumulate. Um, and so, you know, we have to kind of keep that in mind with your patient and they may need medicines um, you know certain medicines to help they may need TPN uh, for this uh, because of that high metabolic rate um, they can have bleeding problems um, of course surgery we got to watch the patient's labs closely if they have to have any kind of surgery cardiac and respiratory status very important uh, because again, worsening uremic uh, can cause pericarditis and pleural effusion, cardiac tamponade. So we got to watch for signs of that. Signs of pericarditis would be substernal chest pain, low grade, grade fever, and we're going to hear that uh, friction rub uh, that you learned about in your assessment class. When the rub, friction rub, 
friction rub disappears, the heart sounds become distant and muffled. And you'll also see a narrowing pulse pressure. Um, so we got to stay on top of that. Um, again, think about those cardiovascular meds. Um, but, you know, they can't, meds, certain meds can't be dialyzed and the patient, uh, you know, may become toxic with the drugs such as hypertensive meds. So we've got to discuss with the doc. Um, one day of meds, uh, one day, oh, shoot, one a day meds uh, can be given after dialysis treatment typically. So we just, you know, need to have that conversation with the attending physician. So interventions, we're going to monitor all medications and doses just carefully and assess pain and discomfort. Check our labs out for sure. Uh, absolute stringent infection control measures uh, need to take place with these patients as well as all patients. Dietary considerations, we uh, you know may see uh, limited sodium, potassium, protein, uh, fluid. Um, it's going to be individualized uh, based on their nutritional needs. And certainly this would be a great opportunity to, to have our dietitian involved. Skin care, the pruritus from that uremic frost. Uh, keep the skin clean and well moisturized. Trim the nails to avoid that scratching. And then, of course, for uh, the uh, peritoneal dialysis, um, teaching about how to care for that. Um, catheter and you know keeps uh, to avoid infection and that kind of thing. So monitoring patient pre and during and post. We're going to monitor vital signs frequently and watch for hypotension. We want to make sure the patient's hemodynamically stable. Uh, so you know we'll check the capillary refill time, the peripheral pulses, uh, the warmth, the skin color, uh, all of those signs, um, any signs of clotting in the line, signs of infection at the catheter site, um, and, you know, infection, watch them for that. Watch them for hypothermia because that can occur as well. And, of course, electrolytes and acid base. Um, and also, we need to teach the patient for home care. Any kind of emergency preparedness for a dialysis patient, think about that. I mean, you know, if there's a tornado or something like that happens, uh, you know, do they have enough supplies? Let's say if it's a peritoneal uh, dialysis patients, you know, they need to have plenty of supplies on hand. And, you know, that's going to require a space thing because, you know, those bags are a thousand liter uh, or no, they're more than that. I'm pretty certain. But anyway, you know, they're going to take up a lot of space. So they need to keep a, you know, a number of bags on hand in case of emergency situation. All dialysis patients need to have a medic alert uh, bracelet of that type and, you know, telephone numbers and, you know, telephone numbers of their dialysis staff and, uh, you know, family and things like that. So emergency preparedness would need to be thought out for these types of patients too. Let's talk a minute about kidney surgery because, you know, there's going to be times where patients have some kind of acute renal failure uh, or chronic renal failure that may in fact be, uh, you know, because of an obstruction, uh, you know, in the kidney or ureter or somewhere there and then, you know, they'll have to have kidney surgery. So. Uh, you know, surgery is usually done to remove obstructions such as tumors or calculi, you know, renal stones. Um, also, they're done to insert tubes like nephrostomy tubes or ureter ostomy tubes um, and to remove a kidney if it's diseased or to do a kidney transplant. So preoperatively, we have to assess prior to surgery that cardiac and respiratory uh, status, what's the rate, depth, and pattern of respirations, um, you know, assessing their pain, what's their fluid and electrolyte status, um, what kind of urinary drainage system are they have at the 
current and what will they have after surgery. Um, fluids um, are encouraged to promote um, increased excretion of waste. Um, usually antimicrobial meds are used uh, to treat any kind of UTI. Um, and of course, you know, we have to be careful with those antimicrobials because some of them are nephrotoxic. Um, you will see coagulation studies such as your PTT and your PT. Uh, platelet count needs to be done and checked uh, for pl uh, platelets and uh, sure that there are plenty there because um, we don't want to, you know, have to deal with a bleeding issue. Um, and then, of course, talking with the family and providing support there. Um, perioperatively, a position based, there's three different approaches. Um, they can go the flank style or the lumbar style or the thoracal abdominal style uh, where they're, uh, you know, depending on what the surgeon's preference are there. And of course, perioperatively, they'll be managing that urinary drainage system and making sure that patient is, uh, you know, hemodynamically stable. Post-op, we've got to be watching about hemorrhage and shock. Um, they may need to have blood after surgery due to a loss during surgery. Um, we've got to be monitoring that abdominal uh, for abdominal distension and paralytic ileus because that is common if you think about where you know their incision is uh, you know there, there's going to be manipulation that has occurred of the bowel area uh, and you know the anesthesia effects of the bowel so um, you know can cause it to uh, go to sleep on us so we got to watch about that so the paralytic ileus and they may in fact need an NG tube to help relieve that distension the abdominal distension uh, because that NG tube decompresses that abdomen doesn't cause pressure on there um, oral fluids uh, given when a person passes gas and we watch for infection uh, they will probably have low dose heparin to prevent thromboembolisms. Um, we got again to look at the location of the incision um, because you know that's going to be painful. Uh, we want to do that uh, splinting and encourage deep breathing and cough and turning. Uh, we want to note the skin color. Uh, again, we got to note the drainage tubes and what you know how much are we having out. Um, you know, the pain, we're going to monitor that, the urinary drainage, uh, we're going to note any kind of ab decrease or absence there uh, because that could indicate an issue for sure. Continuing on post-op, we are definitely going to be assessing, assessing, assessing all the body systems because, again, that respiratory cardiac all that's involved here because it's a big old surgery um, and pain and fluid and electrolyte uh, the you know patency and adequacy of that drainage system uh, so again a decrease in the amount uh, needs to be reported to the health care provider because it could indicate a possible obstruction um, and you know, diagnosis, nursing diagnosis, ineffective airway clearance, ineffective breathing pattern, um, acute pain, fear and anxiety, impaired elimination, risk for fluid balance. Um, our complications here in collaborative care, we certainly have to be monitoring for hemorrhage. So we're going to, you know, pay attention to our vital signs. Our vital signs are crucial. They tell us what's going on with the patient. You want to do the baseline. Look at that baseline and what you got now. What's going on? Are we seeing a drop in the blood pressure? That could indicate a hemorrhage. Are we seeing an increase in the pulse? Are they tacky? Uh, that could indicate hemorrhage. So we, you know, of course that could also indicate pain as well. So we, we got to pay attention to our vital signs, folks. They, they can tell us a lot. What is the skin condition? Uh, we want to uh, definitely look at that and uh, the urinary drainage system, the surgical incision site, and of course level of consciousness. Uh, you know, are they lethargic? Are they confused? Uh, also extreme fatigue. 
Uh, now remember, urinary output less than 30 mLs per hour. Uh, changes in those vital signs, that can indicate that there is a problem. Uh, so look at the, you know, see this patient in your mind. What are they going to look like post-op? What do you want them to look like post-op? Um, you know, if you if you have someone hemorrhaging, you know, they're going to be pale, cool, you know, skin, uh, flat neck veins, change in level consciousness. Um, of course, hemorrhage can lead to hypoxemia and hypovolemic shock and of uh, you know, end result in the MI can occur. So we got to be on top of this and be constantly watching these patients. Pneumonia is another thing. Of course, you know, this is a post-op patient, obviously, and a big old surgery. So we've got to uh, bring up our knowledge of what you learned in perioperative nursing uh, about our prevention. So we got to watch for atelectasis, fever, we're watching for pneumonia, we're watching for increased pulse and respirations and adventitious breath sounds. We've got to watch uh, your patient and do your with your patient that incentive spirometer. Stay on them with that once every hour while awake um, and cough and deep breathe. Um, as, as much as they can. And uh, of course, infection control is going to be very important for uh, infection, uh, monitoring for that. Watch the surgical site dressing changes or take care of those as ordered. Um, the, you know, IV sites, urinary catheters, all of that. Uh, and certainly we want to use aseptic technique. Um, and so for infection, we're going to be watching, again, the vital signs of CBC, drainage from the uh, surgical site, air drainage from our urinary cath. We're going to look at the color, the odor, so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, uh, DVTs, of course. We're going to, deep vein thrombosis is what that is. And we want to do our leg exercises. We want to have our... Um, sequential um, devices, the uh, compression devices on the patient, um, you know, the TED hose, uh, thromboembolytic hose on the patient, stockings, um, and, you know, do good prevention of DVT, uh, getting them up, ambul ambulating as well. Um, want to try to do that as soon as possible uh, because the more they ambulate, the better. Uh, that takes care of that risk. Uh, obviously, fluid and electrolytes, we're going to be watching big time with these patients. They can have both excess and loss uh, potential there. So loss can be due to relief of the obstruction um, or use of diuretics, vomiting, diarrhea, um, you know, that kind of thing. Or if they've got an NG tube, that would be a loss. Uh, so we got to monitor that output from all sources uh, and, and definitely take a look at that. Um, an excess can come from the cardiac effects of anesthesia because anesthesia is hard on, uh, hard on the heart. Um, so uh, we definitely want to be watching our urine output um, and any kind of signs of uh, a decreased urine output could be a sign of excess fluids. Uh, because we could be retaining the fluids. Uh, so we, there we could see a weight gain. We can see pedal edema. We can see output below 30 mLs per hour. Also breath sounds we need to listen to because you can hear crackles. Uh, elevated blood pressure and pulse and respirations. Uh, difficulty breathing. Um, and so if you see that type of thing, you may see that used are treated with diuretics and fluid restrictions. Um, and if that doesn't work, uh, then we may uh, have to be dialyzed uh, to prevent heart failure and pulmonary edema. Also, I meant to mention with DVT, you'll probably have uh, some kind of heparin to give post-op. And so our post-op interventions, um, we want to definitely relieve the measures, uh, pain relief measures, and promote that airway clearance and turn top, cough, deep breathe, incentive spirometer, and positioning. 
monitor that urinary output and maintain uh, potent, uh, patency, that should say patency, not potency, of urinary drainage system uh, and use uh, strict asepsis with uh, the catheter and anytime we're dealing with that um, and monitor for signs and symptoms of bleeding and all of the things that we just talked about. Doing those leg exercises, get that patient up, monitor for signs and symptoms of a DVT. Okay, that can, let's see, I think we got one more slide. Yes, patient education. So we've got to talk to the patient and teach them all of these signs and symptoms they need to work uh, with and notice and monitor. Um, also, taking care of the drainage system. I'll never forget, I had a patient one time called back to the hospital. The patient had been discharged with a Foley catheter uh, and it, the patient didn't call. It was the family that called and no one had taught them how to empty the Foley bag. And they were like, when they called, they said, this bag's about to bust and we don't know what to do. It's like, oh no. But anyway, yeah, we got to teach the patients how to deal and, you know, how to take care of those things if we send them home with that. Um, strategies to prevent complications, you know, doing the hand hygiene, uh, ambulating as much as possible, uh, deep breathing, cough, incentive spirometer, that kind of thing. And they're definitely going to need that follow-up care. Uh, so we've got, you know, we want to be sure to emphasize how uh, and very, very important that is. And that concludes your podcast.